from our survey of political powers of the post Maurya period, we may now move on to the study of polity, political organization, statecraft of this period. It is quite evident that monarchical state polity had become quite familiar over greater parts of the subcontinent and this is an experience not merely limited to the Ganga Valley or North Indian Plains. We should however keep in mind that there were some pockets of non-monarchical political groups called Ganas, Ganasangas. These were located in the Punjab parts of Haryana, in some areas of Rajasthan, also in certain areas of particularly in the forest tracts of present day Madhya Pradesh. We have already indicated that perhaps in the far south the existence of chieftainship rather than full fledged kingship can be seen from our previous survey of political activities in the deep south or the Dravida Desha area. But let us look at the most frequently seen form of polity that is the monarchical state. Monarchy has become pretty widespread in the subcontinent largely because of the impact of Maurya rule over more than a century and that was not merely limited to North India but definitely penetrated into peninsular India. In this case, now let us look at the organization of polity. Many texts on political theory like the Manu Samhita, the Shanti Parvan of the Mahabharata and of course the Kautilya Arthashastra regularly speak of seven elements or limbs that make the state, at least the monarchical state. These seven elements are the Swami or the head of the state, mostly the Raja or the king. Then comes the Amatya or the functionaries including ministers or mantris. The third is the Janapada or Rashtra meaning the territory or more specifically populated territory. Durga or Pura that is the fortified urban area or more specifically the capital of the particular state. Then Kosha that is treasury, Danda or Bala that is armed forces and the seventh and the last is Mitra or Surit that is friendly power or ally of a particular power. All the theorists would invariably consider the Swami or the Raja as the foremost of all the elements or the limbs of the state. While the Raja is the most important, he is closely followed by the high functionaries of the state. Despite the graded importance of these limbs or elements, the very use of the term Anga meaning a limb and therefore indicating the presence of seven limbs suggests that early Indian theorists on polity tried to look at the state as a body politic and this is an interesting situation and therefore like the different limbs of the human body each and every limb of the state had a very specific function to discharge and though they were of graded importance they were in this sense indispensable whatever be their function how important or how relatively less important of be their function each of the seven elements were indispensable to the making of the state. So the concept of a body politic is clearly emerging during this period. Now the same texts discussing the origin of monarchy as an institution, the origin of kingship as an ins political institution brings certain legends out of which the concept of kingship becomes 
clear to us. The story usually is the ruler or the king is absolutely necessary because the ruler provides protection to the life and property of the subject called Rakshana and he also is the principal authority to maintain Palana, maintain the ideal social order that is maintaining the Bodhnasrama Dharma. So, the twin plank of Rakshana and Palana are the sacred duties of the ruler. Since the ruler renders these two vital duties, the ruler is entitled to a share of the produce in the form of taxes. In fact, the taxes in some texts has been seen as wage, vetana for the ruler. So, what emerges from here? the possibility of a very early contractual theory of the origin of kingship in that the ruler renders certain duties and because of rendering those duties he is entitled to a share of the produce which is brought by his subjects. So, the subject has certain functions to render and similarly the ruler also has number of duties to render. So, there is this element of contractual uh, contractual position between the ruler and his subjects. Along with this early notions of contractual theory, in this period very prominently figures the concept of the divinity of the ruler. We may recall that the Mauryas hardly considered themselves as having a divine origin or as the uh, representative of the God in this world. But now in the post Maurya period, the ruler either he is thought in the political treatises as something analogous to say Indra, hero like Indra. He is considered as equivalent to Varuna because Varuna is the upholder of the cosmic law and order. He is considered equivalent to Kuvera because like Kuvera, he presides over wealth. This is something what may be called functional divinity. The functions of certain gods are equivalent to the functions of kings. But beyond that, rulers of this time began to claim either divine descent or claimed direct divinity. The classic case is that of the Kushanas. The Kushana rulers systematically assumed the title, particularly in their inscription, as Deva Putra, son of God, claiming therefore directly divine descent. This title, Deva Putra, was derived from the Chinese epithet that the ruler is the son of heaven. Along with that, the v Kushana ruler Vimok Advices in an inscription claims to have been the authority of cosmic law, not merely the earthly law, but even cosmic law and order, Dom Artha. Similarly, in another inscription, Kushana ruler Huvishka claims that he was Deva Manusha, that is a god in human form. This comes remarkably parallel to the famous dictum of the Manusamita that even an infant ruler could not be disobeyed because he is verily a great god, Mahate Devata, standing in human form, Nara Rupa. So, there is a remarkable parity in the claim of divinity in theoretical treatises and the practice of the claim of divinity by several rulers. Most remarkably, the Kushanas in their coins was portrayed invariably with a halo or a nimbus behind his head. Such halo or nimbus does not accompany an ordinary mortal human being. 
and the use of the halo behind the head of the Kushana ruler indicates that he was portrayed as a suprahuman being, a supramundane being. The Kushanas took this even farther. They established at least at five places dynastic sanctuaries which were called in Sanskrit Devakula and in Iranian and Bactrian language as Bogologgo. These were located at Mat near Mathura, at Surkotal in Afghanistan, at Rabatak in Afghanistan and two places in Central Asia, Khalchayan and Ayartam. We have very graphic description of such uh, dynastic sanctuaries at Rabatak from the Rabatak inscription. In such dynastic sanctuaries, not only the images of Kushana rulers were available as objects of veneration, particularly dead rulers, but even in the very first regnal year of Kanishka, when he was the king, his image was set up as an object of propitiation and veneration. What we see here very clearly is a cult of the emperor. Something like this we have never seen before in Indian history. This is the period when divine rulership was repeatedly claimed by different rulers. And this is also the time when uh, rulers regularly performed various types of Vedic sacrifices like Ashwamedha, Bajapaya, Rajasuya, etc. The ruler definitely is the central point in the administration, but he could not run the administration single-handed and required assistance. This assistance came in the form of the Amatyas, the second element of the state. The Amatyas included the Mantri, the minister and Sachivas who come close to our understanding of what is a secretary, a bureaucratic officer. Thus, we find at Junagar, Rudradaman's governor in Junagar area was an Amatya. Similarly, such Amatyas figure repeatedly in inscriptions of the Satavahana rulers and their successors. We find the Kushanas entrusting the management of regional level of administration with the Kshatrapas. The term Kshatrapa is obviously uh, derived from the very early experience of Achaemenid, the Persian rule in India back in the 6th century BC. This system of satrapal administration is a legacy from the impact of Iranian rule in India. The Shatrapas were ruling during the time of Kanishka, say in the arena area of Varanasi, Kaushambi. Sometimes such Shatrapas were military officers, that is Dandanayaka. This indicates that the Shatrapas, or though primarily looking after civilian form of administration could have come from the military ranks, thereby indicating that there was not much line of demarcation between civil administration and military administration. Apart from the very high ranking Amatyas, there were also Sachivas. Rudradaman was assisted by what is called Karma Sachiva, executive officers and Mati Sachiva, that is secretaries who offered him counsel, Mati, Buddhi, like that. The continuity of the Ahara and Janapada type of locality level administration, that is corresponding to the understanding of districts in present times, is located in the Satavahana realm, also in the Kushana realm, in North India. That continues from the Mauryan times where we had already seen that the district level administration when, was known as either Aharas or Janapadas. 
that system continues while many changes had already occurred. Now, about the non-monarchical system, we may not know great details, but there were groups like the Malavas, the Jodhas, the Arjunayanas, which had their own seals and there these groups claimed them as Ganas, as Sanghas. Some of these groups, clearly non-monarchical in character, were also known for their warlike activities. Now, all these polities, whether monarchical or non-monarchical, could hardly have functioned without some kind of a resource base. And this resource base is particularly crucial for understanding the monarchical polity. Without a sound resource base, you cannot run a complex monarchical administrative system. Interestingly, the theoretical treatises like the Manu Samhita and the Anushasana Parva or Shanti Parva of the Mahabharata lay down how the ruler should collect taxes. The ruler, as I have already said, is entitled to collect taxes, a share of the produce, particularly meaning agricultural produce, because he protects. He, ideally, the ruler should protect his subjects. That is why he is entitled to a share of the produce. The term share of the produce is ideally uh, found in the Sanskrit expression bhaga, share. Usually, that this share is one sixth of the produce. This is obviously the principal resource base. Agricultural sector provides in the form of bhaga, the principal resource base of any polity in the pre-modern traditional economy of India. Along with that, Another term, particularly figuring in the inscription of Rudra Dhaman, along with the term Bhaga, is Bali. We may recall that this term Bali had already occurred in an Ashokan inscription as an impost taken from the rural areas. It is an agricultural tax. So, Bhaga and Bali are definitely there. What is remarkable is in the post Maurya times, many political powers began to collect taxes from the non-agricultural sectors, that is from crafts and commerce. In the Satavana realm, we find artisanal activities came under states' demand for taxes. That is why the term Karukara figures in a Satavana inscription. The term Karu means crafts, craftsmen and Kara is a demand. So, Karu Kara is a particular type of revenue collected from artisans that is imposed on craft like activities. Similarly, the term Shulka figures in the inscription of Rudra Dhaman as a justly levied tax. Shulka is invariably connected with trade and commerce. This is tolls, custom duties, which obviously uh, is related to the movement of traffic, movement of merchants, movement of commodities. No less interesting is the fact that possibly the political authorities in different parts of India had become quite conscious of revenues that could be generated from mineral resources. Take for example, in many of the inscriptions of the Satavahanas, we find there was a system of levying some taxes on salt production and salt is considered a mineral object. Similarly, there were certain mines particularly of diamond in the present day Panna area of Madhya Pradesh, which could have 
yielded taxes to the Kushan state. We find how in the deep south, the Pandya rulers were interested in living, of course in kind, some taxes on the pearl fishery near the Tutikorin area. This area provided the best possible pearls. Now, all these points would indicate that the political powers were interested in realizing revenue not merely from agricultural resources, but also from non-agricultural activities like crafts and commerce. This sets the stage ready to take a close look at the material culture, agriculture and also the non-agricultural sector of the economy. Agriculture indeed is and remains the most vital sector of the economy. There is no doubt that the largest number of Indian population must have taken to agriculture. But there were many areas also in the subcontinent where lived non-agricultural communities like the hunting gathering groups, like the foresters, like the salt makers, like the mining groups. So there is also a lively non-agricultural sector of the economy which we shall take up later. But let us look now at the agrarian scenario. The northern Indian plains watered by a number of rivers of glacial origin like the Ganga, Yamuna, the Indus, the Brahmaputra must have been a major source for making the soil very fertile and that was conducive to the growth of diverse types of crops. And this is not merely typical of the post mauryan period. There is a very long history of the cultivation of crops, particularly cereals, paddy, wheat, barley in the vast North Indian plains. There is no use repeating these facts which are pretty well known from a much earlier period. But what is quite remarkable is how agriculture was being done. A, a superb sculpture from Gandhara area shows the typical peasant plowing the field with a pair of oxen which were yoked to the plow. It is almost a replica of what one may see even today in rural India. Similarly, many implements of agricultural work like the axes, adzes, sickles and most importantly plowshare made of iron have been found from the excavation at Sanchi which is in Madhya Pradesh but and definitely not located in the Ganga Valley. So, the spread of agriculture and the agricultural implements and in many cases the agricultural implements were made of iron. This is seen not only in Ganga Valley but also outside Ganga Valley and even in excavated context. Agricultural prosperity in the post Mauryan period is not merely limited to the fertile North Indian plains, but also beyond and to the south of the North Indian plains that is in the peninsular part of India. A classic example is the name of the place Dhanyakataka. Dhanyakataka is a famous Buddhist site in eastern Deccan. The very name Dhanyakataka which figures in inscriptions literally means a rice bowl. Obviously, the place becomes known as Dhanyakataka in eastern Deccan because in the post Maurya period this area began to yield excellent paddy as crops. We have not seen the growth of regular paddy cultivation on an extensive and long term basis in this part of the Deccan prior to the post Maurya times. This indicates how 
the agricultural practices, particularly long term settled plow based paddy cultivation has penetrated into the peninsular part of India. Without a very sound agricultural base, one cannot imagine the existence of complex monarchical polity in the peninsular part, say under the Satavahanas and also what experienced in the uh, kingdom of Kalinga under Karavela. Agriculture consists not only of cereals, but also of various other types of crops, fruits, plantation. One interesting point is the remarkable spread of textile manufacturing all over the subcontinent, especially in the peninsular part of India. You cannot imagine the efflorescence of textile manufacturing without having the possibility of considerable production of cotton plantation. What is important to remember here is that peninsular part, especially the Deccan, is ideally suitable for cotton plantation because of the presence of the black soil. So, the Deccan area, which is now famous also for textile production, experiences in the post Maurya period the cultivation of cotton, which is definitely not a cereal, but possibly comes close to what we now call a cash crop. It was a fascinating interpretation by D. D. Kosambi that makes us aware that in the first century AD, the Konkan coast in Maharashtra for the first time experiences large scale coconut plantation. In an inscription, Kosambi drew our attention to the fact that a single village had as many as 32,000 seedlings of coconut plants. Similarly, we find in Kerala a particular spice, a plant product, black pepper, Kali Mirch, becomes very famous. In fact, it becomes an exportable item. The areas in deep south called Marudam in the Sangam literature were located in fertile river valleys and ideally suitable for paddy cultivation. So, agricultural activities were spreading in a nearly all India context.